Well, welcome everybody to Midweek with Mark. It's, it's becoming one of my, my favorite parts of the week to, to do this. Um, today's talk is going to be on evergreen maples. And, and, and this talk really came about starting with the, the maple talk originated as part of a, a lecture I gave to the International Maple Society, which it's always odd talking to a, you know, a specialist group about their plants. But a lot of the maple folks are from, you know, farther north, you know, they grow the deciduous maples and things. And so they don't often hear or think about the, the evergreen maples. And then the oak were, we actually came from a talk I gave just a couple of years ago to the International Oak Society. And so that was, you know, they have a little bit more experience with them, but that's where both of these came from. So I tried to make, especially the oak one, a little less technical than it originally was, because I was really talking about some of the new classification and nomenclature that's, that happened with a, a kind of a, a seminal paper in, in 2017 that, that was co-authored by one of my, one of the people I work with in China, Min Deng, who's a real expert in, in um, oaks. So we're going to jump right into it. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. Chris will answer plenty of those, but then I'll also answer at the end. I'm going to try and go through fast because it's, it's longer. It, as usual, I, uh, I kept adding things because I'm interested in talking about this. And as I'm putting it together, I just, ah, you know, I hate cutting it down. I love, I love what we're talking about here with these plants. So without further ado, I will share my screen. If you're not already muted, go ahead and mute yourself now, just so we don't get any background noise. Okay. One of the things that actually, I think this, this talk, this maple talk actually originated with a talk that I gave at the, the Southern Nursery Association, the research conference portion, and then went on to talk at the at the Maple Society. And, you know, it's kind of in line with some things that when I originally did it for the, the research conference, it was inspired by some of JC's old talks where he would take a group of plants and talk about the, where they were in the evaluation process. He'd do it with International Plant Propagator Society and with Southern Nurseries Association and, and things like that. So that's really where this this kind of started. So kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. The, you know, we haven't grown a ton of, of the evergreen or semi evergreen. Some of these are, are not evergreen in cooler climates, but not a ton of, of different evergreen ones that we've grown. Most of the evergreen maples are really tropical to subtropical plants. But to give you a sense of the maples we have right now, we're, we have in our nursery and on the grounds a little over 300 maples, and that's you know 278 different ones, different types. That's I should say 278 or so because we have some things that we're unsure of identification, and we need to grow them out in order to to really identify them. I'm just, I kind of put this one together. This is just really alphabetical. I didn't put it together in, in any kind of uh, taxonomic way like I did with the oaks that we'll, we'll see next. But I wanted to, to just start with many of these, most of these evergreen maples are going to have entire leaves, you know, no lobes, not like what we think of as a maple leaf, not like what you get on a, the on Canada's flag. This is one that we have not so far had luck with, Acer albo purpurescens. This is 
mostly a plant from Taiwan, goes into China a bit. It's in a group that involves one that we'll talk about in a little bit, Acer oblongum, and it's, uh, they, they can be very difficult to tell apart. In fact, some people just put this in with uh, Acer oblongum. Has great new growth color on it. This is, this is it in Taiwan. We've seen it. We have planted out young ones before and neither one of them has lasted a year. They haven't made it through our winters. If it does survive, it can grow 25, 30, 40 feet tall. Got a few more nurseries in the nursery from a couple different collections. We're going to grow them up a little bit bigger before we put them out, get some good wood on them, and see if they're a little bit more hardy with some size. But right now, I would not call them hardy. Now, kind of at the opposite end of the, the, the scale, this is, this is a very different one. Acer bergerianum, variety Ningpoense. Acer bergerianum is the trident maple, and they're down on Glenwood South. They're the street tree down there, or they used to be. I don't know if they still are. I never go down there anymore. It's too crowded now. But Acer bergerianum is widely grown as a, a really tough, relatively small, urban tolerant tree. This uh, form, variety or subspecies Ningpoense, is grows is native to Ningpo in Zhejiang province in in China, which is Ningpo is right at the coast. It's a it's a port area. And so this has in, in contrast to the typical trident maple has very thick leathery leaves. And you can see how how thick those leaves are. It's it's one of those ones that is really not truly evergreen for us here. The leaves are much more persistent than they are on the typical trident maple. But we've been growing it here for over 25 years. We've got a nice big plant. Unfortunately, it wasn't trained as a young plant, so it's got this double trunk in it. But it's right there along Barrel Road by the Southall Garden. Fantastic plant. You know, I think if we went just a little bit warmer, it would really, it would probably stay evergreen into, you know, late January or so, but it does go more deciduous for us. Acer coriacea folium. Coriacea folium means leathery leaves, and it's got these leathery leaves, kind of, kind of like the oblongum leaves, the, the not, no, lobes or at least very few ones. It's the new growth is quite pretty. It comes out covered in these kind of silvery hairs before they they open up and become those thick leathery leaves. And the leaves on this one kind of twist a bit, often curl over, have kind of white on the other undersides. We've grown we grew this here for about 14 years and then removed it. It didn't die. We removed it for another garden. It's, it's native to southern China, uh, Yunnan, Guangxi, down into Taiwan. I've never seen it in Taiwan, though. It can get to be pretty large, well, mid-size, 30 feet or so, with a nice rounded head. It's, it's also been distributed as Cinnamoma folium. Much of what first came into the U.S. anyway came in through a distribution from the Shanghai Botanic Garden in 1983, 84, sometime around that. It came in as Cinnamoma folia, and the, and the Chinese really still use Cinnamoma folia. They say it's different than Coriacea folium, but at least what they what came into the U.S. was 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 definitely Coriacea folium and not something different. Now another one that we have not had success with, Erythranthum. Now 
there is another one called Erie Anthem with, with a I instead of a Y, but this is Erie Thranthum, which means red flowering is, is what it, it, that name means. We grew it for a couple of years. We had it, it's from Vietnam. It'll, it'll grow up, you know, 35 feet or so, apparently in the wild. We, we grew it for a bit, but it died. We lost it completely after two years when we got down to nine degrees. So certainly not a zone seven plant, probably at best eight B plant, but, and, and this one, so far as I know, is not terribly widespread. So it may be possible to get it from a little bit higher elevation, but you know, it's, it's, pretty restricted in its habitat, but it's got these nice long leaves and you can see the red pigment in the foliage. So I'm not surprised that it has, it's got red flowers, although I've never seen it. Now one that we've grown for a long time, Acer Fabry, named for Father Faber, who was in, in China. This is one from Guangdong and Hong Kong. And I'm, I think I know what this plant is, but you know, ours keys out to the correct thing for sure. Certainly looks like it in flowering, but there is a ton of confusion in this, in these evergreen simple leaf maples from, from Asia. And part of that's just because they haven't been collected and grown enough that we really can compare apples to apples. You know, everything's being kind of described from limited herbarium samples. And really we need to grow more of these. So we've been growing this one for 20 years at the Arboretum, never had a problem with it. Ours has been pretty, pretty moderate in size, 25, you know, I would say it's, you know, at, in 10 years, it maybe got to 15 feet. They can apparently grow to 60 feet in the wild. One of the things, one of the diagnostic features is the flowers. They've got these red, these flowers with red calices with white petals in there. Very, very showy in flower, very showy. I looked at some at Westenburg Arboretum and you know, what they had is, as Fabry, I don't, I think I would have thought was something else, but you know, what can, what can you do? But it can grow pretty, pretty tall. This is one at another garden in the Southeastern US. And this is, I think the seeds forming. So you get those red flowers, this may be it in flower, I can't remember, but then you get the maple Samaras are bright red as well. And you can see all of last year's growth still looking good. Our plant, even in the coldest winters, uh, occasionally we'll get some tip die back. We've had some leaves burn and fall off, but it really hasn't hurt the plant. We've grown out plenty of seedlings from it and distributed those pretty far and wide. There's some confusion between this plant, Acer Fabry, and this plant, Acer Levigatum. Acer Levigatum, and it's, it's potentially one that there's some, you know, overlap in the species or what. This is one that Levigatum just means smooth leaf or smooth. We haven't kept most of the Levigatums alive for more than two years, but it gets to be a pretty good sized plant, 30 or 40 feet tall. It's, it's evergreen to persistently foliaged. It's, you know, depending on kind of its location and where it's growing. Now we did bring one back that we think we're pretty sure is Levigatum that we grew out from seed. And it turned out being very different from the other ones we've grown. We named it Honglong, which means kind of red dragon. 
and the new growth comes out just vivid. And then even as it starts to, to age, it goes to almost this black burgundy. And then it goes to more of a, a bluish green, especially if it's out in sun. Right now we have it in some fairly heavy shade in Asian Valley. We've been growing this. We've got a couple plants, one that we've had out for eight years and one that we've had out for six years. Hasn't had any problems. If it gets too cold, it'll drop its leaves, which is great because that's that these evergreen plants that just won't drop their leaves, they wind up getting more damage than others do. So this is one that we've named and we've gotten, we've distributed some and we really, really like. The, the young stems are burgundy, the older bark is, is greenish. Really just a very, very pretty plant with a kind of upright head to it. We have on occasion distributed these. I've tried to grow it a couple of times because it does root, which is nice. But I always plant it out in those little, from those little three and a half inch pots that we use for everything here. And I think it probably needs a little bit more size on it before, before being put out and really doing well. Acer Lorina. Laurinus, while most people will translate that it's a laurel-like, what it really just means is evergreen. Acer laurinum is, you know, evergreen. We've tried this for a couple, a couple times. We've, we've managed it outside for two years, for four years, for one year. We had a couple from before I was here that in the notes, it says they probably died due, the dr due to drought. That was before 2007, so it wasn't that drought. That was, I can't remember, 2002 maybe, which is interesting because they had survived for a couple of years and then died in the drought. I would have liked to have seen them and see if they actually were Lorinum because Lorinum is a pretty tender plant. It's really coming from like Burma, the Hainan in, in China, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. This is the one, I believe the one species that crosses the equator. So it can be very tender where it grows up to like 90 feet tall. From the, the, more, the more colder areas, when you get the ones that are marginally hardy, um, the leaves are persistent, not quite evergreen. They'll drop off in the spring before the new growth starts. But, you know, I think a lot of what's being grown as laurinum is not actually the true thing. But that very long drip tip that you see on a lot of tropical plants, that is that's pretty indicative of laurinum. We did have a, a little variegated one for a little bit, but that did not last long in the ground. Lucidum, uh, lucid means shining in, in Latin. We haven't planted this one out yet. It's a smaller one. It's really, you know, around 20 feet tall, uh, even in the wild. We've got it in the nursery. It's, it's really only native to Guangdong, which is, leads me to believe that it's probably not going to be hardy. But we're growing it out to get a little bit, a little bit larger before we plant it out. So we haven't evaluated it yet. Now, oblongum. Acer oblongum is a bit of a catch-all. It's a lot of things get kind of lumped into oblongum. So if you're a real splitter, um, you could probably split oblongum into a bunch of different species, you know, maybe as many as 10 or 12. But really, when you look at it across its range, it, you know, one form kind of moves into another, but it, it goes from the Himalayas to Nepal, Kashmir, Western China, pretty wide range and in its range it can be evergreen to fairly deciduous we've got it we've got some growing here 
one that was here for 11 years before finally we put it out of its misery. But then we've had a couple others that have been here for almost 25 years and, and are quite large. They can get 45 or more feet tall. So the one that left after 11 years, this is it, it was in the, the mixed border and every cold winter, it just got blasted back. It, it, and it finally got to the point where it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, contrast that with these, the deciduous and semi-deciduous forms we have, which have been growing fantastically. Now, I wish I could say that this is what it looked like every fall with this great fall color. Unfortunately, we only get that fall color about once every four, five, six years. But when we do get it, it's really nice. But usually the leaves just kind of fall off without, without any color at all. But so this is, this is one of those plants where it's really, really important to know where the plant is coming from. Because I could sell you, give you whatever, you know, this Acer oblongum, and it's not gonna be, do very well in this area. Or I could give you this one, which would probably be just fine in zone six. It probably wouldn't have any problem at all. So, you know, the provenance is really, is really important. Now for something completely different, Acer obtusifolium. This is another one of these that has often has lobed leaves, although sometimes they become entire. They don't always stay lobed like this. And this is kind of a little shrub or tree, often is much, much smaller, especially where it grows native in the Middle East, kind of the Levant, if you will, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. Some of the folks in Europe and the UK say this is the hardiest evergreen maple around, kind of a more of a scrubby kind of thing grown in, in hot, dry areas than the, the really elegant Chinese evergreen maples. We've had one growing for three years now. It's doing just fine. It's, you know, it's one of those ones that yeah, it's, it's interesting from a collections standpoint, but it's probably not going to knock anybody's socks off in terms of how it grows as a plant. It might be that a lot, growing out a lot from seed and finding ones with a really regular form would be the, the way to go. And then selecting that as a, as a cultivar, because otherwise they tend to be a little bit, uh, you know, all over the place. Acer paxii. This is one, another one from China. This is Yunnan, named for a taxonomist named, uh, named Pax. This is basically a, an evergreen trident maple. The leaves can be just entire, but often they're lobed. You see like this, it can grow up to 30 feet tall. We have not found it to be hardy. I think it's from pretty low elevations in Yunnan. We grew it for two years, did not survive. I'd like to grow it again, try it again with from known, uh, from the highest elevation in Yunnan that we can find, but we shall see. I don't think it's gonna prove to be very hardy though. And the last one is Acer Sempervirens. The last one that we're growing currently. Sempervirens means evergreen, always green. We've been growing it for seven years. Ours, this is it at Hilliers in the UK. This is about the nicest form I have ever seen of, of Sempervirens. It's another one that's kind of a tree or shrub, growing in kind of the same areas as Obtusifolium. In fact, sometimes Obtusifolium is put as a subspecies of Sempervirens, but Lebanon, Turkey, Eastern Turkey anyway, 
Greek islands. And it's kind of got that same kind of lobed leafing, very, very small leaves, scrubby plant, you know, often grazed by goats and whatnot over there. But ours is not looking like this, but I think if you selected as a young plant, if you started trying to turn it into a tree, that'd be your best bet rather than having it kind of grown as a, a shrub or doing its own thing. All right, I'm going to go straight into oaks. I hope that's okay. We will, we'll discuss, I'll answer questions at the end about oaks and the maples. So here at the Arboretum, we grow about 90 different taxa of, of oaks. About 20 of those are cultivars. So really more, as opposed to many other plants here, we grow fewer cultivars and we do species. One of the things that we have really focused on are the evergreen forms. They, you know, with, with 10 and a half acres, there's a limit to how many great big deciduous oaks we can grow. A lot of our native oaks, they get really, really large. And so by, by kind of specializing in something that a lot of the other oak collectors, especially in the Northeast and, and um, kind of the West and, uh, you know, Chicago and those places, you know, ones that they can't grow, we've really can do something uh, a little bit different and add to the kind of uh, overall collection in the, in the U.S. So this one I did kind of break up into the taxonomic groups that we are growing. I didn't do them in order though, so I kind of jumped from one to another. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I did. In 2017, the, the, uh, the taxonomy was completely, completely revised. And now it is where most of the taxonomy was based on appearance, the, the morphological characteristics. And now the, the differences are much more on a um, uh, molecular and genetic level to really show kind of the, the evolutionary relationships, which in some ways makes the, the, the breakdowns much less useful for actually identifying plants. But, you know, that is how it is. The, the first group is my favorite, bar none. It's one of my favorite groups of plants, period. So it's, it's the subgenus Ceres, but the section Cyclobalanopsis. Often Asian literature will, will raise this section name to its own genus. So they separate Cyclobalanopsis from Quercus. And this is the one, one of the few sections that is pretty easy to identify. Basically all of the plants in this group, all the oaks in this group are evergreen. And they're all the, the acorns, you know, the acorns have, they have the little cupule on the acorn, right? And if you look at that little cupule at any of our native oaks, there's little scales. They're kind of little triangular scales. Well, in Cyclobalanopsis, instead of that, they are concentric rings, very smooth concentric rings, very, very distinct. So pretty easy to tell if you have the fruit at least. And you can see some of the, the ones that we have there and kind of how they, they vary in shape. I'm gonna go through these. So, so the first is Quercus acuta which we've, um, we don't have currently, but we have grown this for over 20 years at the Arboretum, had a plant for over 20 years here. So can be quite hardy. Again, often is a function of where, where it's collected. Grows to about 30 feet tall, nice rounded head, like most of these in the Cyclobalanopsis group. Grows Japan, Taiwan, Korea, China. It is basically has no serrations. Every once in a while you'll get some serrations on there and then has this undulate 
leaf margin with kind of a long drip tip. So kind of that wavy leaf margin, pretty distinctive on there. One of the most widely grown groups is Quercus glauca. Glauca just meaning it has a kind of a, a waxy coat on it that often gives it a bluish cast, sometimes called the blue ring cupped oak. We've got a plant here that has been growing since before the Arboretum was here. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Uh, no, but new growth comes out kind of fuzzy and, and pink opens up and you can see how it gets kind of bluish. Yeah, there's the one that we have in the Arboretum, one of the ones in the Arboretum. And so it's been growing for over 45 years. It was killed to the ground in the, the free, the mid eighties freezes where, where we got just extreme cold, but has grown back out the, despite that. And you can see that smooth bark, much different than our oaks, our native oaks. That smooth bark is pretty typical of Cyclobalanopsis. And this one grows Japan, Taiwan, China, South Korea, and, and in through Indochina. So pretty widespread. So there is some variation in it. Longinux, we've been growing this for 10 years outside. Another one that's, you know, 45 or so feet tall. This one has that nice regularly pretty long, long serrate foliage that uh, nice uh, drip tip on there uh, this one is as far as i know is only found in taiwan um, but attractive plant not seen in the the nursery industry and what's interesting is most oaks are many oaks are difficult to root many of these evergreen oaks are actually much easier than than the deciduous ones quercus morii another taiwanese form we lost we had one plant we lost it the first year it was in the ground I don't know if it just wasn't well established. This gets to be a big plant, 90 feet tall, but it really, its native range is, is about 4,500 feet to 8,000 feet. And basically everything in that range in Taiwan should be pretty hardy, especially, I mean, if you're getting up in seven, six, seven, 8,000 feet, it is definitely hardy. So I think I think we just need to make sure we're getting high elevation forms and you know we might have lost our single plant for any number of reasons out in the garden uh, might just not have gotten established well i don't think it was a hardiness issue uh, the backsides of the leaves on quercus morii are kind of yellowish you can't really see it too well in this picture that tip is almost always kind of twisted like that a fairly wide leaf as compared to some of the other ones, and then these real shallow serrations on there. Mercenifolia. This is a picture I took up in Charlotte, kind of between Elizabeth Lawrence house and Winghaven, being used as a street tree. It's actually a street tree here in Raleigh on Western Boulevard, right right behind the Arboretum, you know, kind of where all the, the fast food places are. It's, it's used as street tree, been here for, been out there on the street for longer than I've been here. We've had it here at the Arboretum for at least 30 plus years. Another one that's widespread, so provenance is important. You know, it's China, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia. You know, the, the Thai forms are probably not going to be nearly as hardy as the, the higher elevation Japan and, and China and Korea forms. But with the best forms, you get these really nice dark new growth. Again, pretty almost lanceolate leaves or, or oblong. Um, serrations on there. Uh, this form, which has almost no serrations on there, 
and I'd really like to see this in fruit because I'm not 100% sure this is Mercinifolia, but this is grown at another southeastern botanic garden. But the new growth is almost black on it. I really need to go up and get some cuttings of it. One day when we're not all locked down. This could be a different species. I'm not convinced that it isn't acuta, but that's why we grow these plants. And so we can see them flower and fruit and really get to identify them because in many cases, you're not going to get to that until you get to flowers and fruit on it. We do have a variegated form, which we actually received its Quercus mercenifolia. And I have it in here from that because I forgot to change it. I, I actually the new growth looks like Mercinifolia, but when you look at the old growth, I think it's Quercus glauca. And those clustered those buds look like Quercus glauca instead of Mercinifolia. So I may have to re-examine re that one. And then the one Chris mentioned uh, early before we started, this white flushed form comes out pure white. And then you can kind of see in this picture, it goes completely green. This is a plant the only place I've ever seen it is Garden Kino Sato in Japan. I actually, I absolutely, the first time I saw it, you know, my head exploded. And the next time I was in Japan, I was presented with this plant to, to take back with me. Unfortunately, we can't bring oaks in from Japan, so I couldn't accept it, which kills me. I may try and see if we can do something with the National Arboretum next time I go over to Japan to see if we can get this back, because this really needs to be in wider cultivation. It is so cool. There's no name on it. All right, I better hurry up or else we're going to be here till five. Quercus salicina, another when you can see kind of this this form often when young they kind of grow upright and then kind of get wider with age all of these cyclobalanops or many of them salicina can get very large 90 feet tall or so we have not had this out in the ground for well excuse me we've had this in the ground for about 11 years you can see these very sharp serrations with the almost a bristle tip to them very distinctive on there I just think this thing is uh, gorgeous, gorgeous. And then one that I'm kind of confused about, Cecilifolia. I see different things. Cecilifolia means the, fo the leaves don't, are, are right up against the, the stems. They're sessel. They don't have a, a stalk on there. But when you look at descriptions and older pictures of it, it sometimes shows Quercus Cecilifolia with a a uh, half inch petiole, which should not be right. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm confused by this. I think this is the correct thing. We've been growing this plant as Cecilifolia for eight years. Um, it's China, Taiwan, Japan. This is actually from Taiwan, but I've seen other ones. Um, another collection in the Raleigh area that looks completely different that's being grown as Cecilifolia as well. So, and I should mention, I didn't mention this with the Cyclobalanopsis, but these are, I don't think, there's about 90 species and they're all native to kind of tropical and subtropical warm temperate Asia and Indonesia. So on to subgenus Quercus. So this is genus Quercus, subgenus Quercus, and the section is Lobate. There's about 120 species of these in North America, which go from North America all the way down through Mexico and Central America to Colombia. So they go into Northern South America. And a lot of these are more the scrubby red oaks. So you can see they can be quite different where when I showed you this, the, all the, the plants were fairly similar. Here you can see everything from these big broadleaf things to you know, pretty uh, narrow uh, 
one. So, first one is Quercus cambii. Quercus cambii. We've had we've had a couple plants. One we've been growing for 17 years. One we've been growing for 11 years. So, pretty darn hardy Mexican oak. It's perhaps more appropriate to call this late deciduous than evergreen, but it does hold its leaves till very late in the year, sometimes called chisos oak. But it grows kind of as a shrubby plant or as a tree or something in between. So it can be quite variable depending on where it's growing. In kind of des more desert conditions, it tends to be a scrubby plant, but it can grow into a 45 foot tall tree. See that kind of serrate leaf with those bristle tips. That's pretty indicative of what in Eastern North America, we kind of break our oaks into red oak and white oak. And this is what these are ones that we would consider red oaks. But you can see this also can have basically uh, no serrations at all. You can see a few little serrations on there, but even when it doesn't have serrations, it'll have kind of that, that tip that's like a bristle tip on there. So it can be quite, quite variable. And I should say, when we're talking about Mexican oaks, Mexico is the center of, of oaks. Asia and, and Mexico are, are where we have the most oaks. And in Mexico, they are in the process of active speciation. So it can be almost impossible to identify an oak. You couple that with a many oaks have overlapping ranges and they are notoriously promiscuous. So there are a lot of hybrids out there. You find a botanist who is willing to go to Mexico and really study the oaks. I will tell you somebody who has set them up for a themselves up for a lifetime of uh, of I don't know work heartache uh, something. They're just there's it's so hard to t I mean do these two look like they're the same plant? Not at all. But, but, so they're tough. Now maybe my favorite Mexican oak and this goes Mexico into Guatemala is Quercus crassifolia. Got these just incredibly thick leathery leaves, but they emerge just fuzzy red. And then the backs of the mature leaves are, are fuzzy, kind of silvery or rusty colored. You can see that in here. And it flowers with those, those catkins and has yellow catkins. So there's a point in the spring where you'll have the old green growth, the bright red new growth, and then these yellow uh, flowers on there. Just amazing. We grew this for 15 years before um, it was uh, uh, knocked down in a storm. We tried our best to root cuttings, but we've never had luck with it. It grows tall. Our plant was quite tall. It can grow 30 or more feet tall, but often where it's found, it's kind of more of a shrubby thing, just a six feet tall, which would be, actually, which would be great for the garden. I'd love a six foot tall plant of this. Beautiful, that was our plant. So you can see, you know, it's a telephone pole behind there. So it's, it was quite tall before it blew over. Oh, that still hurts that we lost it. We do have another one in the nursery, so there's, going. Now, a naturally occurring hybrid between Crassifolia and another species called Crassipes uh, is this Dicephyla. Um, Dicephyla, we've been growing this for about eight years. This is a picture from our garden. It grows to about 30 feet tall. It's only found in, in Mexico. It doesn't get all the way down into Guatemala, um, but it's a, it's a pretty handsome plant. Doesn't hold a candle to Crassifolia, though. Another favorite of mine, Hypoleucoides. This is sometimes called the, the silverleaf oak. This is a mature plant uh, of it. We've been growing Hypoleucoides for about six years. 
And this one is native to kind of southeastern U.S. into Mexico. Uh, it grows in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, down across the border into Mexico. And I think it's just spectacular. That's it in early summer. In spring, when new growth emerges, it's got this kind of shrimp pink color. And you can see the old foliage is still all there. Just gorgeous. Ah, and has not seemed to um, hasn't missed a beat in six years for us. So I think it's I think it's a real, real winner. And on the other end of the spectrum is this little uh, sandhill scrub oak, Quercus inopina. This is from, rather than being from the southwest, this one's from central Florida. It grows in the those pine, bear, uh, the uh, sand hills where it has this just really deep, deep sand base. We've tried it a couple times. It lived for four years once. We've lived for three years and other times. You know, it only gets six or eight feet tall. It's it's probably something we need to really grow in like the Scree Garden or or the Zurich Garden. It doesn't want to be in the, the open garden. But, you know, do we really need to try it again anyway? It's marginally hardy. It's probably not even marginally attractive. It's a bio plant, botanical interest only. So, yeah, who knows? We'll even try it again. Sartorii, now this is a handsome plant. Sartorii, we've been growing for eight years. This can get to be pretty tall, Mexican oak, 60, 80 feet in the wild. Probably not as tall in cultivation, but you see the new growth, a uh, nice lime green against that darker, older growth. Really uh, attractive um, plant. Sartorii is in limited trade in in Texas as a you know as a as a tree you could buy at a nursery. Uh, most of these other ones are not. So now we have a uh, subgenus Quercus section Quercus, which is mostly North America, but it goes across uh, it goes down into Central America, but then it also jumps over to the other side of the world into. Eurasia, Asia, and, and North Africa. So Quercus dorata, which may be a synonym for Quercus dumosa, maybe isn't. Um, we, we grew this plant for about six years before losing it. Um, it grows to kind of 90 feet tall. Uh, Baja, California to um, up into Southern California sometimes called California scrub oak. I like it better than Quercus inopina, but it's still, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a scrubby oak. It's, it's interesting, but probably not going to be attractive and probably not going to be fully hardy for us either. Now, this is another one that is in the trade in Texas as, you know, a landscape tree, Quercus germana. We've got a couple, we've had a couple, we've, one for, we've been growing for 11 years, one we've been growing for 15 years. We had a weird winter that really knocked this one back hard, so hard that we wound up cutting it down and knocked the other back as well, but we've let it come back in, in the plantsman's woods. But it's, it's, you know, it can be grow to 60 feet tall and in the zone eight Texas, it's just fine. New growth comes out with that uh, reddish flush before going just to kind of a, a nice a solid green leaf. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty darn attractive and seems to be doing very well in Texas trade. Quercus gregii, another Mexican little scrubby oak. We've been growing this for three years, so jury's still out on it. You know, we haven't had a real winter for a couple of years, so we'll see. But this is a little scrubby thing, six to 15 feet tall, so more of a shrubby plant than, than tree. And Quercus insignis. This is one from Central America and up into Southern Mexico. Can grow to 60 feet, or excuse me, grow to 100 and 
10, 120 feet tall. The good news about this plant is we have been successfully growing this for six years. The bad news about this plant is it is killed back to the ground every winter and we're going to have a cold winter and it's going to be completely dead. It's not going to come back. It is not hardy here. Wish it was, but it is not. But what's interesting about Quercus and Cygnus is this has probably the largest acorns of any oak. They're about baseball sized. They're just massive. So pretty cool, but definitely not, not hardy here. Now this is another one. Quercus, whoops, back. Quercus polymorpha. Can't, let me get this right. I'm trying to move it, the wrong thing here. Quercus polymorpha. This is another one that is becoming a street tree in Texas, becoming a landscape tree. Quercus polymorpha. This is from Mexico, kind of on the Atlantic side, not the Pacific side. Makes a, a nice, pretty good size, size tree to 60 feet tall. We've been growing this for about 30 years here, so it's, it's been quite hardy for us. Comes out with this kind of leaves, kind of yellowish or pinkish before going green. In cold winters, this will lose a lot of its foliage, but it's got this kind of really nice rough texture, which I think is, is pretty, pretty uh, interesting. Pungens, uh, this is Quercus pungens. This is our plant here uh, just outside my office in the, the dry garden. This is a southwestern species, Texaco, Texaco, Texas, Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, kind of that area. It's a, a kind of a scrubby one. Yeah, probably grows to maybe 15 feet tall. We've been growing it for 12 years, so been pretty successful for us. But again, if you live somewhere where it's dry and you're not, you're, you know, don't want to irrigate, you know, these scrubby western oaks are probably, are maybe good plants. But when you can grow the broadleaf evergreens that we can, that where we have, we have enough moisture for them, it's it probably doesn't offer enough to really make it worthwhile. Uh, growing in, in in a typical landscape. It's more handsome than some of the scrubby oaks. Quercus rugosa, this is it in a botanic garden in Mexico, looking kind of rough, but we've been growing these for 25 years here. And this is, rugosa is kind of a catch-all for things that people can't quite figure out. So it'll grow anywhere, depending on the plant, from 15 to 90 feet from Mexico down into Guatemala. We grow a couple, and we've been growing them for 25 years. And they're actually really handsome plants. The ones that we grow have this really nice rugose or kind of rough quilted leaf. Our plants are kind of in the smaller skies, 20, 25 feet after 25 years. Real nice. Turbinella, eh. we've been growing, we've got a couple, we've been growing for seven and uh, nine years respectively. So if you give them perfect drainage and you get them from the right um, place, you can grow this, another scrubby one, four to maybe 10 or 12 feet. But the key with Turbinella is it grows from Northern Mexico all the way into Colorado. So you get the higher, higher elevation forms from Colorado but not so high that they won't take our heat. And then you give them very good drainage and they can grow. But, you know, they've got that blue green foliage. Maybe if you get it going well and you prune it regularly so it gets denser and denser with that blue foliage, maybe it'd be worth it. But as a landscape tree, it's not gonna, not gonna do it in the East Coast. Okay, so subgenus Ceres, and this is the section Ilex. And these are mostly Europe, North Africa, but they do go over into Asia. 
We've just got a couple of these we grow here. Quercus ilex. This is the holm oak. You see this over large areas of Europe. And the leaves can vary from being almost un, almost not serrated to, at least no, I don't have it, to being very holly-like, which is where holly gets its name. Holly gets, Quercus ilex was named before the genus ilex for holly was named. And, and so holly was named for, for this. We've been growing plants here for 30 plus years. They grow 45 to 75 feet tall all around the Mediterranean region. We helped somebody in the mountains of North Carolina get some acorns from the farthest north coldest location for this. He returned the favor by giving us a couple of little dwarf seedlings that he had found of this. So we haven't planted, we just got those. So we're going to, we'll, we'll grow them out a little bit and then plant them out. But we've got some very cute little potentially dwarf oaks from Quercus ilex and a couple other species. Quercus marlipoensis, very closely related to Quercus engleriana, which is their Chinese. This is marlipoensis is from southern Yunnan. We grew this for about six years, much like the Quercus insignis. It spent more time dying back than it did growing up. And finally, I can't remember if the cold killed it or somebody ran over it, but it was pretty upsetting to me because it was pretty cool. But this grows in like China, Tibet, Assam regions. So it can get to 45 feet. And Quercus filioides. This is one that people who've been with the Arboretum a long time may know. This is basically the Japanese, Japan, China, Korea. This is basically the, the first cousin of our, our, our live oaks. It's very similar to our live oaks. It's a 30 plus foot tall tree. We've been growing it for 30 plus years here. You see, this is an old one. This is growing right beside that Quercus glauca that it was killed back in the mid 80s. This one was also killed back in that those same freezes. And so that's why they both have resprouted as multiple trunked trees. This is the one that was named and that was selected and named by JC as Emerald Sentinel because it was easier to, to propagate there was talk that it, it would form acorns by itself without anyone to, without another one to pollinate it, which I'm not sure if that's true or not. In general, Quercus filioides will never form acorns by itself. This is also, this is in Japan, one that I've seen that this beautiful speckled foliage that I lust, lust after, but don't know if it's, I don't know where it might be in, in Japan now because the owner passed away. Don't know what happened with his garden. So we've got a lot more oaks that are in the nursery that have some preliminary evaluation. If there's a asterisk by the name, that means we've killed it in the nursery after that many, I mean, killed it outside in the ground after that many years. If it doesn't, if it has a years and no asterisk, that means it's still alive, but you know, three years is not much to go by. And then otherwise they're still in the nursery and you know, still need to go out. Of course I skipped Quercus virginiana, our native evergreen oak, which we do have growing out here from pre arboretum days, but um, y'all know about that one. So it didn't seem to be worthwhile. Okay. Whew. As a lot of oaks. Happy to answer questions. Don't know if we have questions in the chat or. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, do you, do you know if we have any?
Sorry, our phone was ringing over here. There was a few oh. questions. There was a few questions in the in the comments. Uh, Hal asked if you had any luck growing Quercus henryi. I haven't grown Quercus henryi since I've been here, I don't believe. I don't know. Did you look it up by any chance? Well, to see if it was in the, the database. I didn't see anything in it. Well, okay. Um, now, one thing I skipped. I'm sorry. Any chance, Hale, that you're referring to Lithocarpus henryi? Quercus. Um, I don't know Quercus henryi. Lithocarpus henryi, which is a an old relative is we do have growing here. We've distributed those. I collected a bunch of seed down in South Carolina at the old bamboo farm or coastal Georgia Botanic Garden now. We distributed those years ago. That does quite well for us and that becomes a great big tree. I skipped all the lithocarpus, the, the stone fruited oaks and castaneas and, and these other oak relatives. Um, but that's, I don't even know if there is I'm, I'm guessing that's what it is. It looks like the internet just refers it over to Lithocarpus. So that, that probably was it. Marianne has just a generic question. What about columnar oaks, Quercus by Wearii? Yeah, so there are a lot of these columnar oaks now. They're not evergreen. The Quercus Wearii is, is the, that's the hybrid between the English oak, the fastigiate English oak, and our own swamp oak, Quercus bicolor. And there are a bunch of them with different parentages out there. Regal Prince is kind of the original Quercus wearii, Regal Prince. The cultivar is long. That's a great plant, but there's also skinny jeans and uh, chimney smoke and birthday candle and all kinds of other ones. Some of them are better than others. I still like Regal Prince is still one of my favorites. I think foliage wise, it's better than the others. YM was interested to know how big Quercus hypoleucoides gets. Um, the Quercus hypoleucoides is, is Probably in, in 20 years, you're probably looking at a, a 20 to 25 foot tall plant, maybe 30 feet ultimately. Okay. I believe I answered Annabelle's question. She asked, will these Mexican oaks be hardy here? You overall showed plants that we have grown here at the Arboretum and added comments if it's died or died back to the ground, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that, and that was, you know, kind of my, my goal. So, you know, polymorpha has been very good, Germana, has been very good. Crassifolia has been great in terms of the, the Mexican ones. And actually, we, one we ha don't have planted out is Tarahumara, which is a crazy looking thing with these big cupped, huge cupped leaves. But that's been, Tony Avon at, out at Juniper Level Botanic Garden has been growing one of those for probably the last eight or 10 years without a problem. Uh, Paul asked about the sun exposure. I believe I answered it. I think these pretty much all like a lot of sun. Yeah, mostly like a lot of a lot of sun. The the Cyclobalanopsis, the the Asian evergreen ones, the first ones we showed, those are more shade tolerant. They they often start as understory trees or on the edge of woodlands. John asked, "What's the difference between a species?" and a cultivar, which I did answer in the comments. I just want to know if you have any comments about that, Mark. Yeah, a species is what's growing wild out, uh, you know, out wherever. So you take, well, to take, to take the oaks that we talked about, Quercus lavagatum is, is a species. It's got a, a fairly wide range. It's, or I'm sorry, Acer, excuse me, Acer lavagatum. Confused myself. Acer lavagatum's got a, you know, it grows in the wild. It's got a fairly wide range. It's, it's going to be variable wherever you find it. 
we, we, one of the ones that we grew out from seed that we collected showed really superior new growth color. And so we named it a cultivar. So if you get Acer Levigata, you could get a whole range of things that'll look slightly different. If you get Acer Levigatum Hong Long, you know you are going to get a plant that is a clone of what we, we have called Hong Long. The example I often give to people is our native Sweet Bay Magnolia. It grows from Canada to Florida. In Canada, it grows kind of as a tall deciduous tree. In Florida, it grows more as a evergreen shrubby plant. And it kind of varies all the way through. So if somebody says, I've got a Magnolia Virginiana for you, you really don't know what you're going to get other than it's going to have white flowers. It's going to be a Magnolia. If, if somebody says, we've got a Magnolia Virginiana Maddie Mae Smith, then you know you're going to get a chartreuse margin variegated form of of Magnolia Virginiana. So the cultivar is just kind of denotes that it's, it's a clonal form of, of the species. I missed this question from Marilyn. She said that most, or that you said, most of the evergreen maples don't, don't have lobe leaves. She wants to know if there's any deciduous maples that don't have lobe leaves. So any deciduous maples that don't have lobed leaves, the one that comes to mind is Acer carpinifolium, the hornbeam or the hornbeam leaf maple. That's an Asian one that's got beautiful, if you just pick a leaf, it looks like something from Carpinus or, or you know, a beech or a hornbeam, but it is a, it's a deciduous maple. I'm sure there are others, but I can't come up with one right now. Well, the, the Acer oblongum that you showed is deciduous or evergreen. Right, yeah, yeah, some of the ones, and some of the ones I talked about are, are you know, the leaves are persistent, as they say, which is kind of, um, every, any idea how many of these trees are commercially available? Now, well, now that's a whole different question. Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes the evergreen Quercus mercenifolia or Quercus glauca are available in this area. I have seen growers growing them, but it's been a while since I've seen that. Like I said, in Texas, some of the Mexican oaks are available. There are some nurseries down there that are growing big landscape sized trees and, and selling them a lot of different Mexican species. Mostly, though, your best bet are specialty places like Forest Farm and Woodlanders for, for oaks uh, and for maples, too, for that matter. Tony and Scott had what they said was a silly question, but I thought it was pretty good. Uh, they asked, what makes these guys Acers? What and makes these guys Acers? Kathy well, DeWitt commented that they all produce similar fruit, which I did comment was correct, but it's typically the floral structures that are conserved. And I also pointed out that genetics are playing a big role now too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, they have all the characteristics of, of maples. They're, you know, from a from gross morphology, they've got their, you know, their leaves are opposite. The bud structure is, is similar. They, then the floral structure is, is very sim is, you know, the same seeds. They all have the, the, you know, paired maple Samaras. So, yeah, I mean, that's, and then genetically, you know, we, we look at them and, you know, one of the big things when, when they really started undergoing a lot of genetic work was, this happened just before I started here was they moved them from their own family, the Aceraceae, into the Sapindaceae family. So based on the, the genetics, they realized that they, they really shouldn't have been in their own family at all. They, they moved them to a different one. Annabelle just asked if any good sources for scrubbing non- or for scrubbing non-interesting Mexican oaks. I don't know why she's um, looking for non-interesting ones. 
Well, no, I mean, they're nice. And, and th I think probably there's some mail order. You know, High Country Gardens may have some. I saw a note in here that says somebody got polymorpha from Far Reaches Farms. They may have more. Oh, uh, Sistus Design Nursery. Sean Hogan has often has the the scrubby West Coast and Mexican oaks. Yeah, Quercus acuta, Camellia forest. Yeah, Camellia forest. You should grow some big acutas. Mercenifolia at Nurseries Carolina. But but yeah, if you if you like those those scrubby Mexican oaks, yeah, check out Sistus Design Nursery. He often has them. And even if he doesn't list them in his his catalog, you may you may send a note, an email to them asking if they have just small numbers available to purchase and tell them that you're, that if you are a member of the Arboretum, tell them you're a member of the Ralston Arboretum. There, uh, Sean Hogan's a very good friend of ours and he may be more willing to help out. So the, the Southeastern native oaks, I got a question about that, like Geminata, Minima, Chapmanii, Myrtifolia. Yeah, those are, those are all scrubby southeastern oaks. Some of them get a little get a little bit larger if you get them away from the coast. We don't grow a whole lot of them, but yeah, they're they are there. I just I have a hard time getting excited about some of those. They're all you know they're, but that's just me that I, I can't get excited about them. And I have something, Mark, and I don't know if there's really a question built in or not. Did you ever, well, I'm going to start off with a question. Did you ever visit the oak collection down in Aiken that the yeah. Woodland folks are doing? Yeah. Any comments you can share with folks? That was pretty outstanding. Yeah. I mean, there there is an amazing, amazing, one of the best oak collections in the world in Aiken, South Carolina, thanks to Woodlanders Nursery. They there's been some, some efforts to get them all mapped and labeled. I don't know how far along they are with that. The city of Aiken did hire a, a horticulturist who seems actually interested in plants. So that's a good thing. It's a neat place to visit. If you've never visited Aiken, South Carolina, you should visit. They have got amazing street trees around there. And you can order from nurseries and from woodlanders and pick up there, but you have to order before you get there, or else there's there they won't um, help you out at all. You can't just go browse there unless something very different changes. And John and Madeline just asked, what was Jamaica's name? It's Jamaica Kincaid. Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, the book that it really introduced me to her was Among Flowers, A Walk in the Himalaya. But she has been variously, yeah, she's, she's, she's done a lot. Super interesting. And I think that takes care of the questions from what I can see. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you joining me. Always a highlight of my week. Thank and you so much, week, Mark. Get some, get some ice cream and join the, the <laughs> interns. It's a great, they're a great group. They're a fascinating group. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Thank you all.